Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our new webinar here with our presenter, Sue Inches from Maine. She's a teacher, planner, and environmental advocate there. Sue is a graduate of the College of the Atlantic and the University of New Hampshire. Sue Inches has worked on environmental policy for over the past 25 years. As Deputy Director of the Maine State Planning Office, she is responsible for a portfolio of environmental issues, including land use planning, solid waste and recycling, energy efficiency, public water access, and building and energy codes. In her role there, she supervised policy research, designed and led public engagement processes, and lobbied in the legislature on behalf of the governor. Prior to this, she worked with the seafood processing, fishing, and aquaculture industries as a director at the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Currently, Sue advocates for environmental issues in the state legislature, teaches advocacy courses at Bates and Colby Colleges. She's also writing a book for citizen activists called Advocating for the Environment, How You Can Make a Difference. So welcome, Sue. Thank you, Holly. It's great to be here, and I'm thanking everybody who's out there for joining me uh, for this little webinar. So the topic today is Earth Stories and Why They Matter. So let's jump right in and take a look at that. So first, I'll start with a few questions. How is it that the ocean is a public resource and yet we allow trash to be dumped into it? How is it that we allow corporations to manufacture hormone-disrupting chemicals? when the serious health effects of these are known? How is it that we allow coal mining and fracking without input from the communities where these take place? And how is it that we can flush unused medicines down the toilet and think they harmlessly disappear? And even a few more. Is it right to burn rainforests and replace them with agriculture? Is it right that 85% of the wealth in the world is owned by 10% of the people? Is it right to allow companies to patent seeds so farmers cannot collect and plant their own? Right to deny education and contraceptives to women and girls? And is it right to leave global warming for our youngest generations to solve? These are just a few moral questions that we face today. And embedded in these questions are the Earth stories that we tell ourselves, both consciously and unconsciously. And we can't fully address these questions until we question our current stories and begin to tell new ones. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So where do these stories come in? Well, I work from a model that things come first into our imagination, then they become thoughts, those thoughts become words, and then finally those words become actions. So that's why it's important to understand what is in our imagination and thoughts, because those lead to the words and actions we're going to take. Well, let me tell you a quick personal story. So when I was a young girl, maybe five, six, seven years old, my family had a place on the south coast of Massachusetts. And right next door to our house was an inn. And it was a pretty good size one, I think maybe about 25 rooms. It was kind of like an oversized bed and breakfast. And from that inn, there was an open sewer pipe that went down to the beach and across the beach and into the ocean. And I remember asking my father back in those days, I said, you know, what, where, what happens to the sewage? Where does it go? I just didn't understand how this could work. And what he said was, well, the sand, the, the sewage flows through the sand, which filters it, and then it flows out into the water where it becomes diluted and harmless. Well, that's interesting. That's an example of the earth story that we were telling ourselves at the time. And in those days, there, was only, there were only 110 million people in the United States, and now we have over 300 million. So times have changed, and that story, that things will just filter out and the earth will heal itself in that way, is outdated. And this next slide will show you graphically how that's true. Look at this. This is the population of the world over the past 12,000 years. And what you can see on the right of that chart there is how the population has grown just since the late 1990s. Obviously, that old story is not going to work for us anymore. 
so also in our history, of course, is the Bible. And not everyone, I think, on this webinar may be a Christian, but that's, I'm just saying, this is the history of the Western world. And in the Bible is a very famous quote, which you see here on the screen, which talks about having dominion, humans having dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living, living creature that moves on the ground. And this Bible quote has been the basis of a concept of dominion as domination. And so here we see that domination, humans at the top of a hierarchy of life, humans as being self-conscious, but other life forms are not, the earth being a resource for human consumption. In fact, the phrase natural resources is just embedded in our thinking. And what are we saying when we say that? We're saying resources for human consumption very often. And humans have worked very hard to tame the wildness of the earth. And I wouldn't be critical of that because many countries, including this one, were settled by people who were very tough and strong and they had a lot to get through. But this concept of dominion as domination has sort of stayed in our brains, even though it may not be working for us so much these days. The other, another aspect of domination is the idea of a hierarchy. White people over people of color and native populations, men over women, adults over children, people over wildlife, good wildlife over bad wildlife, as in rabbits might be good and coyotes may be bad, industry over environment, business and jobs over community. And our history also is about conquest, uh, conquering the earth, taming the wild lands, carving out a subsistence living, and in the process, wiping out buffalo, carrier pigeons, wolves, many other species, and unfortunately, many native communities as well. And I'll just tell you a quick story that really illustrates um, how this story of domination can play out. And as uh, Holly mentioned earlier, I spent seven years in fisheries management here in Maine, and I lived through the story of the collapse of cod in the North Atlantic. So what happened? Well, back in the 1960s and early 70s, there were many foreign ships in U.S. waters scooping up a lot of fish, in particular uh, ships from factory ships from Russia and Eastern Europe uh, would come out to our U.S. waters and stay there for months just scooping fish and then processing them right on board. And these, we're talking millions of tons of fish. Well, it's at that point in the early 70s, people in this country uh, were tired of that and they passed what's called the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which you'll see here on this slide in 1976. So the Magnuson-Stevens Act basically reclaimed 200 miles from shore to 200 miles offshore as being waters where only U.S. fishermen could fish. And look at the wording here on this slide, that the Magnuson-Stevens Act is the legal provision for promoting optimal exploitation of coastal fisheries. And certainly the idea was that we could exploit those fisheries. And what people thought was, now we've kicked out all the foreigners, it's gonna be an unlimited resource. We're gonna make lots of money, it's gonna be great. And what happened was the federal government offered low interest loans to all the fishermen so they could buy very large fishing ships with the biggest uh, trawl nets that they've ever we've ever had actually. So they greatly increased the fishing capacity through those low interest loans. And so this happened in the late 70s, early 80s. And the next slide will show you what happened. There we have it. So if you, as you're looking at this graph, the gray bars are the, are the millions of pounds landed each year uh, in, in Portland, Maine, right? The port of Portland, Maine. So the very peak is 22 million pounds, which were landed that year. And this is the time that I was working in fisheries. The, the fishermen were making lots of money. The black line on the graph there is the price of the fish. So not only did the landings go way up, the prices went way up and people were doing very well. The unfortunate end of the story is it didn't last. Those large ships with the huge trawl nets basically fished it out in a very short time, about 10 years. And now, if you look at this graph, um, in 2020, uh, we are landing about 10% in Portland, Maine of what we were landing in the late 1990s. So the whole thing collapsed and it was all based on the idea that was in everyone's mind that this resource was unlimited and we could dominate it and we could do well and everything would be fine, which of course it wasn't. 
But we've made some progress on this old story, but we still have a lot of pieces of it that we hold unconsciously. And one of my one of the expressions that really um, sort of bugs me the most is this uh, expression called underutilized species. And people talk about this all the time, even today, not realizing that what they're really saying is that all the fish species are there for human consumption only. And so if we're not consuming them enough, then we're underutilizing them. Human-centric, anthropocentric way of, of viewing the earth. And then there's some other examples here too. Uh, we do uh, have some sense of speciesism, some animals and wildlife we like and some we don't. And then of course, when we wanna get rid of something we don't like, we just uh, sort of put sanitizers, herbicides, pesticides, without regard to the whole system that's affected when we're trying to actually just get rid of one species that we don't like. So these are things that we're still practicing and holding unconsciously, even as the world is changing around us. So our historic Earth story has really been about separation. And if you ask school children, where does water come from or where does food come from, they'll probably say the faucet in the grocery store. That's because we're so separated from where things in nature are coming that support us. We're also separated from each other. And there's been a lot written about the breaking down of communities and congregations. And we're also separated from the consequences of our actions. Uh, most people are not aware of the conditions where products that they purchase are made. And of course, most of us don't see where our trash and waste is going. So we're not so aware of that either. And then in the uh, professional management of fisheries and forests, we are pretty much still managing by species by species as opposed to managing on a whole ecosystem basis. So it's all about cod or it's about salmon or it's about halibut uh, or flounder. It's not about the whole ecosystem. And similarly in forestry. And in agriculture as well, we're still managing agriculture as monoculture, which is really trying to dominate and get as much out of the earth as we can, as opposed to working with the natural cycles. So we need a new story. And my, my focus is that in order to address climate change and the problems we have, we have to have a new story. And that story I would call the story of connection. And what it means is that all life is part of an interconnected web. And humans are not at the center or at the top, but are part of a much larger ecosystem. And that a forest is a single living thing with many parts, as opposed to hundreds of separate species. And that humans are connected with each other and with all of life. And this story of connection is also about complex systems. And here's an example here, that the atmosphere, the land, and the ocean are all part of one complex system that produces the weather. And the universe is a living, living, creative, experimenting experience at all levels, from microbes to cosmos, a quote from Margaret Wheatley. So back to what I said earlier, in order to address climate change, we have to address the entire system. And that includes finance, planning, transportation, energy, land use, agriculture, and more. We can't, we can't manage these issues on an issue by issue basis. It has to be uh, from a larger, more systemic approach. Now this new earth story has been emerging and it's actually very exciting all the things that are being written right now about this and here on the slide you'll see um, a number of titles that I would recommend and there are many more out there but these are some good ones. Um, the Hidden Life of Trees uh, talks all about how the forest, uh, all of the forest life is connected to each other. The Overstory by Richard Powers is a uh, current bestseller it's a novel, uh, but it's all about the connection between the characters in the book and their relationship to nature. Climate at a New Story is a wonderful philosophical book by George Eisenstein. Climate Church, Climate World is from a prominent congregational uh, Christian pastor, very much about the moral questions about the environment. Um, on Care for Our Common Home, many of you probably heard of this. This is Pope Francis's encyclical that he wrote in 2015 and it just is a beautiful statement about the spiritual aspect of our humanity and the earth. And then finally Sacred Instructions uh, is a book by Sherry Mitchell. She's a Penobscot Indian from Maine, a wonderful, wonderful book talking about the culture that she grew up in and how sustainable it could be. 
And then finally, I want to say that this new Earth, Earth story, the reason I put new in quotes there is because it's not really new. In fact, uh, many Native communities for generations have been living in harmony and balance with the Earth and not been in this human-centered uh, kind of Western way. So it's exciting what's happening, that people are waking up to the fact that we need a new Earth story. And going a little deeper into Sherry Mitchell's work, she talks a lot about male and female energies. And basically she's not talking about men and women per se, but that we all have male and female energies within us. And what she talks about is a balance between the two and that being energy is, is female and doing is male. And she talks about how these two sides work with each other in decision-making in her tribe. So basically, what happens is that, and I'll go to the next slide to show you that, is that the men make plans. What are we going to do? What action are we going to take? And then they give those plans to the women who weigh those plans against many criteria. How will the community, the environment, how will our future be affected by this decision? And so in the tribe, they go back and forth and negotiate to find where the best balance might be. It makes decision making slow and deliberate but it's designed for balance. And I think uh, what she says is she believes they've achieved that fairly well. Well, it's very interesting that I ha happened to attend a presentation by Stephen Smith not long ago, and he's the CEO of L.L. Bean, a big retailer that's located near where I live in Maine. And he told a story about making a decision about whether or not to go ahead with guaranteed overnight delivery of their products. Now, of course, as you probably know, there are many other retailers that do have guaranteed overnight delivery. But at LLB, and they deliberated on this for a while, and they realized that if they went to overnight delivery, they wouldn't be able to give their employees two days off in a row, and that that would reduce the health and productivity of their workforce. They also realized that overnight delivery would, would cause inefficiencies in the delivery system. Um, for example, you might think about um, a UPS or a FedEx truck going up and down the same road three times in one day just to deliver, to, to make that guaranteed overnight delivery. Very inefficient, lots of extra carbon emissions, um, lots of extra labor time and all of that. So they knew at L.L. Bean that they might lose some customers. They knew that they would not be in the most competitive position on this issue if they did not guarantee overnight delivery. But they decided to go the other way. They said, we're going to guarantee two-day delivery. And that way, we'll have a healthier, happier workforce. It'll be better for the environment. And what Steve said in his talk was that at that company, they strive to consider all the stakeholders in decisions they make. So they look at customers, employees, owners, delivery vendors, suppliers. They want to make a decision that's the best for all, including the environment, as being a stakeholder. So very interesting and exciting to see that this kind of decision making is starting to take hold. So I'm going to move into a little bit about worldviews, which are related to Earth stories, and how liberals and conservatives think. And this section is based on work by um, George Lakoff. And some of you might have heard of him. He's a, a cognitive linguist at UC Berkeley in California. He's written quite a few books. There are two of them here, Moral Politics and Don't Think of an Elephant. And I use these books actually in the college classes that I teach. And the first thing to think of is what happens when I say to you, don't think of an elephant? Can you not think of an elephant when I say that? Of course not. And why is that? Well, that's because our brains unconsciously are wired up in terms of metaphors. And an elephant, here's the picture of the elephant, is basically a metaphor in our brain. We know what it is. And so it's basically, we are hardwired in our brains uh, to think in metaphors. And here are a couple of examples on this slide. So warmth and being held or rubbed as an infant becomes affection. And then we think of a warm person as being an affectionate person. That's a metaphorical example of how our brains, based on our experience, become hardwired. Second example here, uh, back in the 1880s, a horse-drawn carriage carried you where you wanted to go. And the sensation was of a slow, bumpy, and sometimes very chilly ride here in New England. And so the first cars 
became were called horse loose carriages because that was how you got places um, and provided a very slow, bumpy ride and very chilly. Actually, most of the first early cars were open uh, without even roofs on them. So anyway, we think in metaphors, those are a couple of examples. So Lakoff was wondering about a lot of conundrums that he saw. And maybe you've thought of some of these things too. I know I have. And here are several examples. One is, how could a person be pro-life on abortion and yet in support of capital punishment? I mean, it would seem from my point of view that um, it would be life would be sacred on the one side and not sacred on the other. And so it's hard to understand where the logic might be there. Another one, why do most environmentalists support immigration? Won't more people in our country degrade our environment? And a third one, well, if single payer healthcare saves money, why would conservatives, who are almost always concerned about budgets, oppose it? Very interesting. So what Lakoff discovered was that basically public policy is a family metaphor that We've all grown up in families, and some of our families are very different from each other, but that the nation is perceived by most people unconsciously as a family, with the government being like a parent and we are like children. And so common sense, actually, which people use that phrase a lot, really just means ideas that are lining up with your own personal family metaphor. But let's look a little deeper look at how this works. So. Lakoff discovered basically two different worldviews called the strict father and the nurturing parent. And if you look at this slide, you'll get a kind of an idea of what these look like. So on the strict father side, parental authority is based on father knows best, and the children and the spouse must obey the father. And the children are basically born wild and need good discipline to become good. And the world is a very dangerous place and needs and the family needs protection, usually from the father. And the focus is on individual responsibility. Well, a completely different family might be a nurturing parent family, where parental authority is based on caring, nurturing, and protecting. And that instead of a hierarchy, the emphasis is on fairness and equality. And children are born basically good and need nurturing to bring this out. And that the world is a good and abundant place, and people will do well if they just have the opportunity. And the focus is on community and social responsibility. So how do these worldviews play out? Well, under the strict father, mostly things are considered to be just direct cause and effect. Too many immigrants coming in, we need to build a wall to keep them out, as an example. And poverty in that worldview is an individual problem. And any kind of extra support will make people more undisciplined and dependent. So usually poverty is thought of as people who didn't pay attention in school or they didn't work hard or they didn't follow the rules. And under this strict father worldview, us and them are seen as very different. The environment is seen as a natural resource that should be managed to support human life. And I should say that many people with this worldview do want to see the earth be stewarded well, but it is still here to serve us. And environmental problems are caused by bad actors, maybe individual bad actors who need to be disciplined. And as you've probably figured out by now, strict father worldviews do translate pretty closely into conservative political positions. On the other side of the coin here, nurturing parent families think more in terms of complex systems. Multiple causes create the effects. In the example of immigration, Immigrants are fleeing violence and economic instability, and those problems need to be addressed to stem the flow of people over the border. That poverty in this worldview is a social problem caused by inequality and lack of support. The poor just need a better chance to succeed. They see the world as we're all in this together. The environment is sustenance and needs to be protected from harmful human activity. And that environmental problems are systemic and need solutions that address root causes. So again, um, you can see that this would be translated into a more liberal or progressive kind of political position. So it's really, the really interesting part about this is when you apply these worldviews to public policy issues. And in my college classes, I at this point usually have my students do an exercise and you'll see the slide from it where I ask them to take some issues and try to analyze both the cause 
and then recommend some policy solutions based on the two different worldviews. So we're not going to do the exercise because we're just doing a lunch and learn, but I will show you, um, we'll take the tooth decay, increasing tooth decay in children and look at that and see how different the policy solutions are depending on the worldview that you hold. So here we, here we have it. And this is a real problem. Childhood dental decay is on the rise. And this is a case study taken from the Frameworks Institute, which does a lot of research on public policy issues. So under the strict father worldview, poor oral health is an individual problem. And it's caused by kids and parents not brushing and flossing enough and so they don't want to see any kind of a tax on sugary drinks or fluoride in the water. They don't trust dentists and doctors. Um, so that's how they see the issue. On the other side, we see the nurturing parent. See, and their view would be that poor oral health is really a community problem and that kids need access to dental services, dental services in order to prevent the decay. And that inexpensive treatments like dental sealants and fluoride treatments should be available to all kids, and that low-income kids are at greater risk of dental disease, so they need more help. Well, that's interesting. So the causes are seen as being completely different things, and I'll show you on the next slide, the recommended policy solutions are also entirely different. On the strict father side, well, the policy solution, let's educate the parents to, to, to brush and floss regularly or daily. So they'd probably do a campaign, an educational campaign. On the nurturing parent side, they would probably uh, institute some programs where dentists and dental assistants would seal the teeth of children. And perhaps they might introduce fluoride in the water or they might remove sugary soft drinks from schools. And there are others, other as well, but what I wanted to show you is just how different the policies are depending on what worldview you hold. And similarly, these two groups often have a really hard time communicating with each other. In fact, um, I would imagine some of you out there have experienced this. You're trying to talk to somebody who has a different worldview and they just can't hear you or you can't hear them. And that's because a lot of words we use mean totally different things depending on the worldview you hold. So here's some examples on this slide. Big government to some people means too much regulation. To other people, it means too big a military. Freedom, really interesting one, to be safe by carrying a concealed weapon. Or freedom might mean to someone else to be safe by banning guns from public places. So you see what I'm saying. I don't know that I need to read through all of these, but totally different interpretation of the same word. It's no wonder we have a hard time communicating. So you can also, as you might guess, uh, these two worldviews have very different views of what the earth is about. So in the strict father, nature is seen as an adversary to be conquered or a wild animal to be tamed or a mechanical system to be figured out. And in some extreme cases, nature is, is my slave and is here to keep me. Very different from the nurturing parent who says, well, nature is a living organism whose needs must be met. And nature is our home for us to care for. Nature is an injured victim who needs to be healed. And going further, Nature is God's dominion. We talked about that on the strict father side. It's a resource for human use and private property to be used and controlled by the owners. And on the nurturing side, nature is our mother who provides for us. Nature is an interconnected whole, which we are all part of, and nature is a divine being to be revered and respected. It's very different earth views there. And so how does that translate into environmental policies? Well, here's how it does. Um, the strict father worldview tends to focus more on people and the economy than the earth. We must protect our private, our private investments. This view supports individual and market-based solutions such as a carbon tax or a cap and trade program. On the nurturing parent side, well, the earth sustains us, so therefore we must protect it from harm. And that would be done through regulations and through community and social solutions. We would ban toxic material, we would reduce emissions, we would invest publicly in land conservation, recycling, and renewable energy. These are just examples of things that would be supported. So I just wanna mention that we've been looking at some pretty strict models here, and that most people do not actually hold just one or the other of the two worldviews. We're all pretty much of a mix. In fact, examples might be someone might be liberal on social issues and conservative about the military, for example 
or somebody might be a critical father at home, but believe unions should protect workers' rights and they would challenge corporate authority at work. So that's also interesting. So who of these groups would be the most likely to be persuaded to change their point of view? We talk about this in my classes. And of course, it's those people that are the most mixed in the middle that can often be changed on their point of view. So I just wanted to say this, that there's the models are kind of academic strict things, but most of us are human with a kind of mix of different things. And we wanna look for those people who might be somewhere in the middle and maybe be persuaded in order to um, move environmental policy forward. All right, great. So we have Earth stories and we have world news. Where do we go from here? Well, social change begins with a change in thinking. And it's really interesting. I've studied a lot of social movements. And what I see is that it's not until the moral questions come up that change really starts to move. So a great example of that is mothers against drunk driving. So when I was growing up, drunkards were considered kind of funny. It was kind of like a, a clown. In fact, there were TV shows where people would be drunk. I don't know if any of you remember the uh, Jackie Gleason show. But he actually drank on his show and and acted, I was probably acting, but he stumbled around and everybody thought it was funny because he was drunk. And in those days, you know, drunk drivers uh, got into accidents, car accidents, and everybody thought it was terribly sad. Someone would get hurt or killed and we'd all weep and, you know, have a big funeral service. But we didn't do anything about it. And then Mothers Against Drunk Driving came along and they said, no, wait a second. Driving a car drunk should be a crime. It should be a crime. There should be a legal limit of the alcohol level in the blood that would determine if they were under the influence when they're driving. There should be penalties and people should get designated drivers if they're going out to party. This was a whole different way of thinking. And what it represented was the moral question, is it right that people should get hurt because others are driving drunk? To raise the question. And it wasn't until we got to that question that the whole issue pivoted. And I'm not trying to say that they, you know, Mothers Against Drug Driving were very effective at campaigning. And it took a lot of campaigning to make this change. But the point is, the change would never have happened if they hadn't raised that moral question and shifted our thinking around what it is to be drunk and driving a car. Same thing with smoking. I won't go so deep there, but one of the things that's really interesting to me is my grandfather, died at age 39 from lung cancer due to smoking. And he died in 1937, leaving three little girls and his wife. And so I asked my mother, I said, mom, did you know in 1937 that smoking was bad for your health? And she said, yeah, of course we did. And so I just found that completely fascinating because people already knew they shouldn't be smoking, but they just kept on doing it, even though they knew it was bad. And it wasn't so quite a lot of years later that the question was asked, is this an acceptable thing? And that the challenge came from the Surgeon General to the tobacco companies to turn this around and say, no, wait a minute, it's not acceptable to sell these products and say that they're all right for you when we know that they're not. So another great success story where we turned our thinking around is the rivers in the United States. And these rivers were the engines of industry in the 1800s all the way up until 1950 providing water power in the beginning, and then later that water power became electricity that uh, basically powered all our manufacturing plants. And for quite a long time, rivers were very, very stinking, and the Cuyahoga River, which is near Cleveland, Ohio, had caught fire maybe five, six times. But what happened to change this was broadcast television in 1969. The Cuyahoga River caught fire again in 1969, and it was at nighttime. And on television, there were pictures, there was footage of the flames leaping up into the dark night sky. And that was the turning point right there. People saw that and said, wait a minute, is it acceptable for our rivers to be so polluted that they're burning? So that, and at the same time that was going on, television also broadcast a lot of footage of smog, mostly in Los Angeles, California, actually. And so it was these visual images and the stories that went with them that questioned that status quo and said, wait a minute, is it all right that we're allowing our rivers to be so polluted they catch on fire? Is it right 
that the air in Los Angeles, California is so polluted that it's unhealthful to breathe. So it took those moral questions and very quickly things changed. And so many of you may know this environmental history, but in the 1970s, a lot of uh, very significant legislation was passed in this country, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the establishment of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the, uh, the NEPA Act, which is the permitting uh, legislation for any large project. Um, and all of these issues were passed with bipartisan support and signed by President Nixon, a Republican. So you can see it was the moral questions were asked, it was bipartisan support and the changes were made. And it was all because we changed how we thought about these things. Rivers used to be, you know, a symbol of industry and all good. And then we said, wait a minute, don't want to have them be that polluted. So what's really exciting to me, this there's not a lot of good news about climate change, but this right here is a little piece of good news. And what it is, is that over the last 12 months, maybe maybe 18 months, 12 to 18 months, the moral question has finally been asked. And that question is, is it right to leave climate change to the younger generations to solve? I'm so grateful to all of the young people in particular who have been striking and speaking up and saying, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. Because to me, that is a pivotal turning point. Once enough people see that, then we can take the actions we need to turn climate change around. So in the photographs here, you probably know these people. On the left is Alexandria AOC, I guess is what they call her. I can never remember how to pronounce her name, but she's a legislator in Congress who was the um, sponsor of the Green New Deal. And over on the right, you have Greta Thunberg, who has been speaking out uh, to the UN and to youth groups about climate change and asking this moral question. So just a few other slides here to show the evidence that things are starting to pivot. And this is the climate justice literature uh, graph. You can see how these issues are starting to really rise. And this slide shows you, and this is old, it's actually, there are more cities in the US now that are committed to the Paris Agreement, but back a year ago it was 407. I think it's up to over 420 now. So lots of people are starting to come around to this. The US Climate Alliance are states that have agreed to meet the Paris Accord goals. And their strategy is a state by state. In other words, what they're gonna they're trying to do is get enough states to commit to this that eventually they'll have the whole country with them. So that's exciting. The strikes that have been going on have grown by leaps and bounds. In 2017, the People's Climate March had 300 events. In 2019, it was up to 2,500. So I think basically we've asked the moral questions and things are starting to turn. And so we'll go back to those moral questions that started out this presentation. How is it the ocean is a public resource and yet we allow trash to be dumped into it? How is it that we allow corporations to manufacture hormone disrupting chemicals? and serious health effects that these are known? How is it that we allow coal mining and fracking without inputs from the communities where these take place? How is it that we flush unused medicines down the toilet and think they will harmlessly disappear? These are all moral questions which have to be challenged and questioned before anything will change. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just a quick look. These are the other questions we asked. And so what must we do about all of this? Well, what I would say is we need to raise the moral questions and challenge our assumptions. That's the only way we can make change happen. That's what we did with the rivers. We need to tell the story of connection and move away from the old story that's so deeply embedded in our mind. We need to embrace both market and regulatory solution. We need to pressure decision makers to make decisions that support the new story. We also must find ways to create an economy that takes all the stakeholders into account, including the earth itself. We need to assist on accountability to each other and to the earth. We need to elect decision makers who understand the new story. And we need to align our politics, business, and actions with what we know to be true in our hearts. And with that, I would be happy to take your questions and it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you, Sue, for such a provocative presentation for us. So very interesting. I can tell you right off the bat, there are people asking 
for you to send a list of your book recommendations. So I think we can do that. You can, you can yeah. help me with the technology, but I'm, I'm sure we can. Yeah, and, and then we can send those out to the people that um, registered for this webinar. Yeah. Um, so what are some tips for talking with people who are skeptical about climate change, Sue? Well, one of the things that I, I teach in my class um, is to try, you, you should never challenge somebody's values, but rather acknowledge those and um, try to be understanding even if you don't agree. And then the other thing to do is to bring it down to local experiences. So for example, here in Maine, we have uh, no shrimp season anymore. This is a fishery we've had for you know, over a hundred years. In the last three years, it's been canceled. And that's because the water is too warm for northern shrimp. So here in Maine, everybody would know that. So you want to try to relate issues to things that people actually experience in their own life, whether it's, you know, storms or, you know, the, the date that the ice melts from the lakes or the shrimp season is gone, or here in Maine, we have Lyme disease. That's a new thing. So really, you know, not challenging people's values, but instead shifting to uh, real things that people experience that are climate change related. So that's something I always would recommend. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a challenge. Do you think it's possible to change someone's worldview? Well, actually, that's a tough question. It's not usually worthwhile to try to do that. People are pretty you know, they'll, they, in fact, if you try to challenge their worldview too much, they'll probably get defensive. They might even shut down. Uh, so a strategy is to try to find, uh, you know, ways of thinking that might fit with their worldview. And an example, actually, that is growing right now is on the evangelical Christian side. There are quite a few people that are talking about what they call creation care, which is basically having gone back to Genesis and instead of looking at human dominion over the earth, actually say, no, wait a minute, I think it says in there that God told us that um, we should care for the earth. And there are a lot of quotes around that. So it's like taking what their values are and trying to expand it in a way that makes it fit for them. So that's, a, that's one example of doing that. But really challenging worldviews is a, it's like a, not, a, not an effective strategy. What you have to do is try to build on where people are and show them something new that might fit. Yeah, that kind of leads into this other question I have from someone who says, how, how do we get people with different world views to listen to the story of connection? We gave that example, but do you have any more? Oh, yeah, let me think. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's a question saying, you know, I, I see where you're coming from, um, and then tell a story that is actually a little different. An example would be, you know, let's say somebody believes that people are poor because they're lazy. So what you would do is you would tell a story about a mother with, a, you know, like a single mother with three children who works three jobs in order to make ends meet. So yes, they sort of believe that poor people are lazy. You show them an example and it's a true human story. And that's the key to it, is telling a human story that actually cuts through, you know, people's sort of solidified positions. And so I always, you know, say to do that. And so maybe, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's like the story I told about the sewage uh, at my summer home. You know, it's, it, this is a personal, you can't, you know, someone's telling you their personal experience. I saw that, it stunk, I wondered why it was like that. You know, that's how you get through people's, their worldview is by telling a different story. And usually it needs to be a human story they can relate to. Well, that's you. Thank you. Um, let me just shift gears a little bit and set, uh, someone asks, do you see many decision makers that consider multiple stakeholders? And a follow up to that would be, how do they handle trade offs when stakeholder when some stakeholders are affected negatively and some are affected positively? Wow, that's a great advocacy question because that's what advocacy work is all about: is um, you're negotiating between stakeholders who want different things, and it's not easy. It's a very challenging thing to do, but that's exactly what happens. And um, an example that in my own experience was I initiated a statewide uniform building and energy code for Maine. And as it turned out, um, and I worked on this for about two years to get it passed, and it turned out there were over 30 stakeholder groups with different positions at issue. And so basically what I had to do is I had to talk with all of those groups 
and figure out what they were willing to accept and what they were not willing to accept. And, and so that's how bills actually sometimes get amended. Um, an example in that, in that case was the, um, the Maine Lumbermen's Association, and they wanted to have like something that would protect their market, right, in the building and energy code. So they wanted to have us put in an amendment that would say, you know, something like, if available, Maine lumber will be used in construction, which actually didn't take away uh, from the overall purpose. So we were willing to do that for them. So I don't know if that answers the question exactly, but that is what you have to do is negotiate. Um, and the decision makers are doing this um, with the different stakeholder groups. And that's why sometimes people feel that legislation gets watered down because it can, because of the different interests um, that are there. So it's, it's hard work um, to do that, but that's, that's basically what has to happen. And that's really fundamental democracy too, is that you have to take um, all these stakeholders into account and try to craft something that will at least work if not be you know the most pleasing to everyone at least it will work for the majority compromise yeah yeah exactly <laughs> that's that's a lifetime career right there <laughs> yeah yeah uh, another question from one of our viewers says thanks sue it seems to me that one of the differences that is drawn between the strict father or conservative view and the nurturing parent or liberal world views is the concept of individual responsibility for example, yeah. brush your teeth versus community responsibility, put a tax on sugary drinks. Ultimately, do you think that many issues around sustainability come down to individual behaviors? For example, driving a more fuel efficient car, separating solid waste between trash, recycled compost, etc. Well, you know, it's interesting. We need both uh, for to address climate change. Um, we need both individual action and community action. And then as it turns out, the way the data shows us is that some of the really big things like energy generation, those need to be, um, th those are gonna, there's gonna be more of an effect from changing those than there is from individual behavior. But we need both um, in order to meet the challenge. So, and that's such an interesting thing because I kind of personally believe that we need to move towards a more nurturing place but at the same time, I see good in the strict father view because some of the market mechanisms are actually uh, are very good. They're not the only thing we need, but they're, they can be very helpful. So it's kind of like finding, again, a good balance um, between the individual and the community. But we certainly do need community solutions more um, than we have right now, as, as we also need individuals as well. But certainly the community solutions will have a bigger impact. That's a really good question. Um, do you think that climate change can become a bipartisan issue again, like it was in the 1970s? Well, it is to hope. And I, I sort of see some good signs. You know, I see, uh, in fact, in my classes, I have a whole segment on conservatives for the environment. And um, there's sort of two different directions that this is coming from. One is the um, evangelical direction where particularly young people that are in those uh, denominations are saying, wait a second, I think we need to be caring for the planet here. And so they're creating this whole creation care movement, which has started. And then the other uh, direction that things are coming from is uh, sportsmen's alliances. So these are people that like to hunt and fish and be in the outdoors and they're seeing changes and they wanna keep fishing and hunting and they wanna pass that tradition on to their children if they can. So. Some of them are starting to talk about conservation um, and environmental issues as well. So I'm hoping that we're going to get there. I don't, you know, we've gotten very polarized. We all know that. But I think as, as the moral question is asked and as more and more people are having experiences, big storms, fires, that sort of thing, I think it will become more bipartisan. And it certainly needs to be um, if we're going to really solve it. So I guess I'm really hopeful, but we've got a ways to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take this one last question for you to say, uh, how do we get people with different worldviews to listen to that story of connection? Oh, that's a great question. So um, the best way to do that is to tell uh, human stories that cut through all of the political positioning. So um, in other words, like I was saying earlier, if, if the belief is that um, somebody is poor because they didn't pay attention in school or they aren't working hard enough, 
then you need to find a story about a real human being who maybe that person had a learning disability and, and could not achieve in school, or maybe that person, um, you know, is working three jobs and doing the best they can, but, you know, they're still poor. So it's, it's telling those human stories uh, to, to get through. Like I could tell you another case study I use in my class is um, about an extreme um, abortion uh, measure in, I think it was um, Mississippi. And it was gonna outlaw abortions no matter what, even if it, there was a danger to the woman's life, you know, there was just like no. And so a whole campaign was actually created there that said, yes, we understand, um, you know, your religious feeling about abortion, but there are extreme cases where maybe it's the right thing to save the mother's life. Or maybe, you know, it's like, basically building on their values and saying, yeah, you know, I, I respect your value that, you know, you feel that, um, you know, for your religion, this is not a good thing, but there are certain occasions where an exception needs to be made where, you know, the woman's going to die, you know, so it's like sort of breaking through the belief with a personal story. And the way that campaign ran is they had incredible ads with um, young women telling their story. You know, I was just a college student. I was raped and, uh, you know, I, you know, and, and, and this young woman in that, in that commercial was just a lovely young college student, you know, really innocent. And, and so it's saying, yes, you know, this would normally not be something you would do, but there's certain occasions where it should be permitted because there's a personal story and a personal need there. So it's really that, about that. It's, it's getting to the, to the personal instead of the political. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for all your tough questions and interesting answers. And um, we wish you well in the rest of your journey here. And uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Hey, Holly, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great. And I wish I could see all the faces out there, but I hope everybody mm -hmm. has enjoyed this. Because I've certainly enjoyed sharing with you. Thank you. I'll end this webinar now. Goodbye. All right. All right. Bye.